rally is held demanding the release of two members of a hip-hop group who were arrested after a confrontation with police. Rebel Diaz members, Squad Stars, and G1 were taken into custody in the Bronx Wednesday afternoon. Press release from Rebel Diaz says the two saw the officers assault a food vendor. They took out a cell phone to record the incident. The officers approached them. The authorities say the duo became unruly with the officers who were helping sanitation and health officials investigate illegal food vendors in the Bronx. But community members say that's not the case. They got me in I want to turn them off for the patchy dead and again beating up the South Bronx. Cop watch for the criminals that work the system. They put us all in prison. I will not be a victim. I will fight for the future of my unborn children. I got soldiers marching outside the 41st precinct. Never escape the numbers. Will right. multiply. This is unjustified. It's unjust. <laughs> But some I ain't even do. I'm struck with justice, man. Justice for who? The street sweepers getting clean for the white people. Developers in bed with the politicians. Now we got more arrests. My text from the feds. Go to more prison beds. Fill them with kids that are told they ain't shit by school system that breaks their spirit. Niños solitos, la migra y sordedada. Niñas solita, la mama trabajaba. No hay alternativa to the black and the hustle. If you're poor, when you're young, they gon' question what you up to. Put you against the wall, knees on the floor. Guns pointing at you like the fire is war. Scare tactics won't make me quit. God violence won't silence the consciousness. Jeez. No sleep, no water, no food, no drink. Just ticks on the clock, not the time to think. Dreams of revolution with upscale weaponry, psychological warfare, and bullpen therapy. 42 inmates, the toilet smell nasty. Screaming out for justice, so my voice get raspy. Smoking by the toilet, they flush it with smoke. Staring at the empty wall, but the youth give me hope. Spirit so strong, my people protested for us. I swear I heard free the rebel death the chorus. Somebody with money won't forget bit of the vendors, and I think gentle. Of the secret agenda. Please let me break it down. Let's keep it real simple. The vendor got harassed by the health official. The health official's mission was enforced by the commissioner for the mayor and his investors. Oh, you can <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. DJ Illinois on the ones yeah, and twos. Yeah. Doing Hi, everyone. Do. Welcome to. I'm sorry. Now you good. Hey. Go ahead and let us represent. <laughs> know, Thanks, Illinois. Thank you, guys. Rebel Diaz for opening up the show. My name is Elena Martinez. I'm one of the artistic directors of the Bronx Music Heritage Center. And we want to welcome you to um, this, this May's program, Voices of Justice, the Role of Art, the Artists in Social Justice Movements. And the reason we started putting this program together was because, of course, in the last year, as you know, everyone knows, we've been through a lot in the past year, whether there's been issues of um, racial injustice um, and because of the pandemic, health and housing injustice. So um, we, want, we wanted a way to look at some of these issues. But since we're primi primarily an arts organization, how do we as an arts organization, how can we sort of bring some of these issues together with activists and artists to talk about this and for other artists, maybe to give them ideas of how, you know, how you can use your voice and your artwork to, 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 to give, you know, give yourself a platform, give yourself a forum um, for um, speaking out on some of these issues. So today, um, 
we're re the, the program for today is about called the People versus Mass Incarceration. And as usual, our program is um, curated and hosted by the members of Rebel Diaz, um, who um, we know from the Bronx, but now I think they're um, all over and some of them are in Chicago, Jersey, maybe some Bronx connections still. And we're really excited that they're always here to help us because they're able to um, bring together people from all over the country. One thing that the pandemic has brought um, you know, in terms of maybe a benefit from this past year is that doing things um, virtually, we've been able to connect with people we might have not been able to connect before all around the country. So tonight we're gonna have, um, you know, some great people who are gonna be part of this program. Um, Danny Murillo from the West Coast, um, who started Underground Scholars, to back here in Brooklyn. We have um, Lisa Jesse Peterson, who some of you might know her book as a poet and writer. She's worked, um, you know, she talks about it in, the, in her, her book, talked about working with um, incarcerated youth. So we're going to have all them talk about this issue of mass incarceration um, in this country, but also um, how they're dealing with issues like we all know about the school to prison pipeline. But what about the prison to school pipeline or how can using the arts, um, how can the arts be used to help people um, through these situations that they're in? So um, with that, I'm going to give it over to um, Rod Stars to lead to host the event. But everyone, you're watching this on Facebook. If you have any questions for any of the performers, participants tonight, please put it in the Facebook page and we'll let them know about it and they can um, answer your questions. So um, Rod Stars, thank you. That's what's up. Thank you, Elena. Peace to everybody tuning in. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this is Voices of Justice. And you know, the way we do things around here, we're going we gonna to have a nice convo. We're going to build. You know what I mean? The idea, we got folks from all over. Shouts to Danny Murillo coming in from the Bay Area. Uh, Lisa, are you in New York? You, 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 in, you in NY? Okay, we got Lisa NY. We got my brother Jose Martinez representing the Bronx logo. You know what I'm saying? In the Bronx. We got DJ Illinois. We just brought us in with some music. Uh, he in Chicago. G1 is in Chicago. And uh, you know what I'm saying? Chairman Fred Jr. is going to be joining us as well soon. Um, but look, we always start off by saying this. We are living historic uh, moments of oppression, which we can only respond to, uh, to survive with historic moments of resistance. Uh, for us, our weapons, uh, our culture, you know what I'm saying? Because the reality is, is that we don't got stealth bombers or drones, or, you know what I'm saying? Like the reality is our culture. Uh, we, it is our job as cultural workers to make ideas of change uh, and revolution be irresistible. And, and I, we always say that art and culture isn't something that you sprinkle on uh, to society or to a social movement. It's, it's an integral part. It's one of the main ingredients, you know what I'm saying? And, and whenever you have art and culture that comes from communities that are oppressed, 99% um, of the time, the messages that come out from those communities are gonna be uh, messages of resistance, messages of survival um, and, and messages of, of upliftment. And so for us, you know, we, we, we come from hip hop culture, but we also, you know, uh, I have always shown, you know, last, last, the last Voice of Justice we had uh, the last poets on, you know what I'm saying? And so we show love to, to, to the spoken word. Um, and, and the, you know, like I was sharing earlier with Lisa, it's what inspires us. But what we're talking about is mass incarceration. Uh, it's a serious thing, but at the same time, we want to break it down. Y'all know how we do. We always try to break it down. So folks understand, we don't want this to be an academic lecture. We want this to be a conversation because the reality is, is that, Mass incarceration, people getting locked up, people going to jail, affects everybody. It affects everybody because of the numbers uh, of our community that are going to jail. And so we, we need to put that in the, in, into context historically. So I want to pass over the conversation of my brother G1, who in Chicago, you know what I'm saying? Uh, it's crazy because we rebel Diaz, but we all in different places. So we, we don't really get to see each other that much because everything that's going on. So G1, uh, break it down. Welcome, brother, for, for being, and I always, you know, got you on deck because you always bring that knowledge. And so um, break it down for the people so they can, you know, see what's up. Or word. Thanks, Rob. Peace to everybody. Peace to, to the Bronx Music Heritage Center. Um, so, yeah, we just going to want to set the foundation of our conversation today. And peace to, to, to Danny. Peace to Jose BX. Peace to everybody joining us. Uh, and, and thank you, Rob Stars, for helping put together this amazing, uh, cool people coming together to share ideas. Um, so first of all, real quick, we just want to be clear that we want to understand mass incarceration. Uh, as a weapon, it's a weapon of, of organized state violence uh, under capitalism, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a weapon wielded by the rich in their war on the poor, pretty much. And in the case of, uh, uh, of the empire in which we live in, in the US, the incarceration system lies on this foundation. And that foundation 
is a foundation of European colonialism throughout the years. Uh, you'll see a map here that shows uh, all of the uh, different uh, places that was uh, conquered by, by Europe, the Euro different European uh, process of colonialism. This next map shows the enslavement of African people. People was taken from their lands and, and, and taken to the Americas. It's a foundation of the wealth in the country that we live in. And we look at the loss of land for indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. This, this is the foundation in which our incarceration system uh, uh, stands on. These are supposed to be videos. I'm not sure if they uh, if they playing here. Um, they playing for y'all? Nah, they're not playing, right? All right, well, that's cool. But we're going to see. Let me see if I can get this through here. Boom. Well, there you go. Well, now we see the land loss, slowly but surely, all right, that goes down. Um, but we 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 resisted, and I think that's what the Elena was was referring to at the beginning. Uh, Rod stars as well. We had our spiritual songs of resistance. We had our quilombos and maroon territories throughout the Americas, liberated spaces where people could practice their culture against these new forms of colonialism. But the 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 oppressor was scared, so they banned the drum. Right? They banned. They they uh the the U.S. Army used different forms of new technologies like the phonograph to document indigenous dances, to, to, to surveil them in order to eventually eradicate them from the land, all right? So we see here how technology was used. Uh, we have the example, I'm not sure if y'all seeing this here, the, uh, the prison blues. Y'all seeing any images or y'all just seeing text right there? No, we see them. Y'all see, see that file right there? Right now it's just text. Uh, all right, oh, yeah, I, now I, I see it, now well, I see it. We, so, so, you know, we had this legacy of, of our culture being exploited and it's, it's, it's seen as fear of what we face. Uh, when we talk about the culture that we use and the mediums of communication that we use, a lot of them has been invented and funded by a war economy, which is the foundation of the empire we live in as well. This war economy um, and a lot of the technologies that we use to communicate today was funded uh, by, this, by, by this war economy that's based on conquest, that's based on a system of settler colonialism and incarceration. All right. And so in the, in the 20th century, in the second half of the 20th century, that, that oppression that was going inward now goes outward to the rest of the world, imperialism, all the places that are in red. In this picture right here are places where the U.S. and CIA intervened after World War II. All right. In our country of Chile, where me and my bro is from, is, marks the beginning of what we know as neoliberalism, which is a fancy way of saying new capitalism. That's the system that we in to this day. All right. And it started with this experiment uh, with a coup that resulted uh, in thousands of people dead. And the result was a new economy that privatized everything, education and privatized healthcare, pension plans, roads, water, electricity. And that model has become global in the last 50 years. So we're gonna look at that. Cause if y'all look at this date, since September 11th, 1973, well, this is the Bronx Music Heritage Center because on August 11th, 1973 was considered well, the first hip hop party. Cool Herc got together his peoples and was cutting up the brakes considered one of the high points, the beginning of hip hop culture, or one of the points of beginnings. And that's August 11th, 1973. And so we're gonna look, cause this is the world that we live in today is this economy that was created from the seventies moving forward, all right? And this, the hip hop was our resistance to that. And, and so we're gonna look at these last graphs and then we'll continue the conversation. This graph shows the number of, of manufacturing jobs that was lost in the United States. It starts in 1970, the overall trend is manufacturing jobs going down. All right, so places where before you could get a job at a factory and feed your family, starting in the 1970s, them jobs went overseas. They went overseas through this project right here, right? The U.S. military intervening in other countries in order to secure natural resources and ex exploit the land for the benefit of the corporations. And so that's why we had loss of manufacturing jobs in the U.S. since the 1970s. Again, we're going to continue looking at that year, 1973, the decade that hip hop started. All right, this graph shows productivity. The dark blue line is productivity. The light blue line is hourly compensation, wages, salary. All right, in the 1950s, after World War I, every, excuse me, after World War II, everything's going good. Think things are pre being produced. People are making money. At one point, right around 1973, those lines diverge. The productivity keeps going up. The wages flatline. All right, one last graph. This graph shows the number of people incarcerated. It starts in 1925. It's pretty steady for most of the beginning of the 20th century. Well, guess when it starts to skyrocket just a little bit. If you look here around 19, the middle of the 1970s, 
there's an explosion in incarceration rates. The decade that hip hop began, we had about 200,000 people incarcerated in the United States. 45, more than 45 years later, that number's almost at 3 million. If you count the number of people that are on um, parole, probation, house arrest, that number, or, or, or immigrant detention centers, that number's going upwards to 20 million. So we living in an era of mass unemployment, of stagnant wages, and as a result, mass incarceration. For when we talk about mass incarceration, we have to be clear it's a result of the economy and the needs of the ruling class. And at the end of the day, when you talk about settler colonialism, which was the, was the graphs that we were shown at the beginning of, of the slave trade, of the loss of land uh, right here in, in the US for, 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 for indigenous nations, that's settler colonialism. And settler colonialism don't just mean you go and take the land. It means that eventually the people that you're going to take that land from is going to be it's gonna be okay to get rid of them, to eradicate them, to, to, to be able to be in their place and to silence them. And so we see that for the sector of the populations that haven't been needed for the last 50 years, the result has been to warehouse them in this mass incarceration system. All right? in, that same, in that same decade, in, excuse me, in the same era, 1970s, moving forward, the military spending has continued to go. So we can't separate this system of mass incarceration from this militarized economy that's the heart of the empire. And hopefully as we move forward with the conversations that we go on, we could talk about this situation because this is what the pronostics are. They're saying that, oh, incarceration is gonna actually go down moving forward, okay? Well, maybe mass incarceration and the traditional system of incarceration that we've seen may change, but what we're looking at in the future, and this is the part that maybe we could talk about more later, is this idea of e-carceration. And we're not just talking about ankle bracelets and house arrest. We're also talking about that entire system being expanded to everybody. Rod Star, you talked about the idea that, you know, we, we, uh, we can't all be, we, if, if none of us free, can't all of us be, what's the, what's the, I gotta say it better. Uh, if all of us ain't free, ain't none of us free. All right? And that's the idea I wanna take home because again, if you continue this idea that we're living under a settler colonial state, at the end of the day, they're going to make sure all poor people, no matter if you black, brown, red, white, Asian, indigenous, whatever you are, if you're a poor person, eventually they're going to deem you like you unnecessary to their global economy. So when we talk about automation, when we talk about the, the ideas of the future that could be amazing to be able to serve humanity, but if it stays under the power of the capitalists, under the power of the ruling class, what we're looking at is a system where this incarceration, this mass incarceration goes beyond just a few million people and it goes into the entire sectors of society that is deemed uh, unnecessary for the functioning of the economy. Um, that's it. That's what I wanted to share. I don't know if I ramble too much, but peace to everybody for listening. Um, and I definitely want to get into more of these uh, conversations in detail with the folks that's here building with us today. <laughs> Yo, my man said, give me 10 minutes to break it down real quick. I feel like I've got nothing else to say. No, that's great. Appreciate you, G, for always coming up. I feel like G got like a knowledge section that we have before every Voices of Justice where he breaks it down. And we ask for that because I think it's important to put things in context, right? Um, you know, uh, we got folks, like, like G said, uh, the lifespan of hip hop culture has been one of mass incarceration. You know, when you talk about, you know, uh, the, the drug war that puts so many of these, you know, young folks uh, behind bars, um, you know, which, which was, you know, when you look at the, the roots of who put those drugs in the community, you know, the conversation only goes further. But I think that, uh, I appreciate G for putting it in the context historically and not stopping where we're at, but also giving a context for what the future of incarceration looks like. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy because we're talking about hip hop and we have like folks that are, you know, supporters, but, you know, don't get it twisted. Jay-Z wanted to be one of the main investors in the ankle bracelets, you know what I mean, for house arrest. And so I think that we, 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 uh, we also have to be clear on, on, on who our allies are and who are the folks that are profiting. You know, I always say, follow the money. Who are those that are profiting from the incarceration, um, you know, of, of, of people from our communities? Um, but with that, I want to give now, now that we all, everybody good, everybody clear on what we're going to be talking about, I want to give a proper welcome, you know what I'm saying, uh, to our folks that are on this virtual panel, you know what I mean? Um, some of you I've met in real life, others I've just getting to learn about the work, but I'm seeing the connections I, as we were talking earlier. So it's going to be a, a, you know, this is the idea that we have a little conversation. So I want to welcome uh, the brother Danny Murillo, you know what I'm saying, all the way from the West Coast. 
um, that I had the opportunity to meet um, when we were, you know, doing some work. Shout out to the homie Froggy who connected us. But, uh, you know, he, he's basically telling me, man, you are, I'm, I'm building with this crew, underground scholars that are formerly incarcerated uh, folks that are not students at college. And, you know, he was like, yo, this is like a prison to school pipeline. A lot of times in movement work, you hear about the school to prison pipeline. I'm like a prison to school pipeline. And so I was mad open. And, and you know, so we definitely want to hear more about that, Danny, you know, about that work, about underground scholars. Um, next up, we got, you know, uh, the brother Jose BX, you know what I'm saying, represent the Bronx logo. You know, as you can see, like I said earlier, you know, I'm representing as well breaking it down with the people. But more than anything, Jose's with us because Jose just came home. He just recently, you had, it was your year, one year anniversary of coming home and being out in the world. You know, since we definitely want to welcome you. Um, but I know it's been a momentous year because you've been nonstop, you know what I mean? With the hashtag not going back to jail. You know what I mean? You got your own, you know, clothing business that you got going on. But more than anything, I feel like the positive uh, energy that you're sharing with the hood, that's really, uh, to me is, is, is really where it's at as far as like, you know, being with the people, you're not online, you literally rolling up into people's hoods every single day with your car and, and you're, you're, you know, with the trunk store, but it's bigger than the clothing. I see it. Uh, I see the energy that your movement is building up because you're about building with the people directly. And so I definitely want to hear about your experience, your recent experience being behind bars and coming home and what that looks like and, you know, sharing some of that. Uh, we also got, uh, Lisa, Jesse Peterson, an amazing poet, author, uh, organizer who has experience working behind bars and being bringing the cultural work uh, to prisoners, you know what I mean, to young folks as well. And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to hear about some of these, you know, poets, because I know some of the illest poets are, are, are behind bars, you know, so I definitely want to hear some of those experiences. Um, we got Chairman Fred uh, coming on soon I, he, he just hit me up he just touched down but it's an honor you know what i mean we have chairman fred hampton jr the son of legendary black panther party leader chairman fred hampton who recently you know has been all over media because of the film uh you know being oscar nominated winning oscars uh you know judas uh uh and the messiah but you know the story of how chairman fred uh as a 21 year old was assassinated, you know what I'm saying, by the Chicago police in conjunction with the FBI and the counterintelligence program, which is COINTELPRO. Some of that, you know, we, we, we bring this all together because we were clear that we can't talk about mass incarceration without talking about, you know, political prisoners, which really the, the beginning of the political prisoners, you know, a, a lot of those, you know, of the Black Panther Power Party, the Black Power Movement that were put behind bars, it was, it was a direct attack on stopping the uprising you know what I mean, of, of people that were coming together. And so we're clear that incarceration has been part of that tactic and silencing voices, assassination, torture uh, has been part of their tactics in silencing social movements. So we're gonna have Chairman Fred Jr. joining us a little bit later on. But um, I wanna set it off uh, and, and, and go out to the West Coast and start off with Danny. Um, Danny, first of all, Thank you for being with us. Thank you for rocking with us. And thank you for the work that you do. You know what I'm saying? Uh, tell us a bit about yourself and a bit about the work. And, and also, you know, you're also a formerly incarcerated, you know what I'm saying, brother. So tell us a bit about, you know, about your experience. And then, you know, and, and then we'll keep, we'll keep the convo going. For sure, for sure. Yo, thank you. Thank you for, for the invite. Yo, um, I remember, I think it was like five years. I was, I was at the 10 year anniversary of, of Rebel Diaz in New York, right? When, um, so that, you know, it's always a, uh, a pleasure to be in, with, in company with y'all, man, and um, and thank you to everybody else that's here today, right? So, um, yes, uh, my name is Danny Murillo. I I'm currently living in Los Angeles. I'm originally from Los Angeles. Um, I was released from prison in 2010 after spending 14 years. Um, seven of those years were in solitary confinement in Pelican Bay State Prison. That's pretty much where my educational journey started. In terms, of at least, academic, right, inside a school institution, um, I was taking college correspondence courses. Uh, but prior to that, I was always into reading, into studying, right? In particular, um, in prison, right? In, in, in solitary confinement, even much more so um, the exposure to education that I was being exposed to um, by the people around me, right? Which was, it was, we weren't doing college courses. We were just learning, uh, educating ourselves, right? But the education was critical, right? Um, you know, I remember being introduced to, um, to um, 
Eduardo Galeano, right, uh, in prison, right? Uh, you know, some of his writing has been very inspirational and foundational for me, right? Su Comandante Marcos, you know, so upon release, I knew that I wanted to kind of continue my education. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, somehow, some way, I, I got into UC Berkeley. I snuck my way in, in there. And um, on my first day there, I met another individual who was also in prison, um, in solitary confinement, same place. We knew the same people, but we never met each other. And from there, you know, we started building, right? We started building together to establish a program, Underground Scholars. It was just a student club. Now it's a student program. Um, it exists in, in, in seven other, um, eight other, uh, I'm sorry, it, it exists in seven other UCs, either as a student club or as a student support program. Um, and we're really just trying to support folks as they come home, right? But most importantly, right, understanding that, you know, not just using education as a transformation, as, as a tool for transformation for individual self and for, for our communities, but also making sure that we understand that there's, there's power in collective unity, right? Because a lot of times, you, you know, when you talk about the privatization of education, it becomes very individualistic, right? And it removes us away from this collective mindset, right? That there's power in unity, right? And that we can move, um, we, we can move uh, social and cultural, we can make social and cultural change, right? Through, through unity, right? And, and so a lot of times, you know, uh, for us, it's important that, that we center political education, right? Political education has to be the center of the work that we do. Because for me, the work that I do is to see my work abolished. I don't want to work in this work because, you know, but that but what that means is that um, by my not, by me not not wanting to my work to exist is because prison shouldn't exist. You know what I'm saying? Um, so I'll leave it at that. Appreciate those words, brother man. Definitely, you know, the the work that y'all doing is is, is incredible. Um, and you know, you know, one of the things that impacted me about the time that we visited y'all was that you guys had opened up. Uh, the membership of underground scholars, not to just formerly incarcerated students, but also to family members, you know what I'm saying, of, of people that have been affected by incarceration. So I remember I, in the offices, there was like a young compañera whose father had, you know, I, I guess was doing, like, was doing like a really long bid, you know? In Illinois, he was doing a long bid in Illinois, um, in, the, in the state prison, Wendy Pacheco, yo. yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, re I remember that because I feel like to be 100% honest, it was one of the first times that I really, it really hit me. Like, you know, you, you think about it, but the way y'all broke it down um, was that the idea that incarceration doesn't just affect those that are incarcerated, it affects families, it affects the communities. And, you know, so if you're talking about like the stats that G was throwing out earlier, that you have almost, you know, 3 million people you know, plus folks that are on, you know, parole, probation, or, or folks that are in immigrant detention centers, that number goes up to almost 12, 15 million, if not 20 million, right, when you have all folks that are living in the shadows of, of also being undocumented. Um, but it just shows you how that, that, that if those are the folks that are affected, imagine the families and communities, it's a way larger number. And so to kind of keep the conversation flowing and going, and we're going to get back to you, Danny, but I feel like that's a perfect segue to pass over the conversation to Jose. You know what I'm saying? Uh, Jose, you know, introduce us real quick, but also, you know, tell us about your experience. You just came home. You know what I'm saying? Tell us about that experience, about how that affects families and communities. We were talking about that last week when we were chilling, but share a bit, a bit, a bit about that because I feel like, uh, you know, you, you represent the streets right now, brother. You, you know, you we, we could talk about incarceration all day. Danny did 14 years, but you just came home, you know, less, less than a year, you know, about a year ago. So talk yeah. to us a little bit about that, about what you're doing. Well, I've been home a year. Um, I'm trying to get to the point that I, I don't want to say I just came home anymore because I've been home a year now. But, you know, as many as much time as I spent in prison, it's still a year. It doesn't even average out. So you still feel you just came home. Right. But let me talk about the kids. You know, the kids. When you have a parent in jail. And which like I had a parent in jail, I put myself in their shoes and they father used to pick them up every day. And then they father stopped picking them up. They father used to come to the music recital or parent teaching night. Now they father ain't there. You understand me? So we heard our children more than we think by the prison population. But I don't like to say that it was just my actions. I feel like society itself sets, up, sets us up for prison. Me and our kids up. For example, going back to what your brother was saying, I don't have any graphs, anything like that. But in 1865, the 13th Amendment was passed that abolished slavery, but the same token stated that if you, be, if, if you become a, a, an inmate, you also could work under slave wages. 
this became a business. Jail is becoming a business. It sets us up. In 1935, the Housing Authority, right, um, created NYCHA. And if you work, if you lived and you worked under a certain amount of money, like twelve to under $12,000 a year, you can live in these buildings. So what happens is the kids that live there, they can't, they can't work. Because if you work and you make something yourself, the rent will go up. So therefore, we found different angles to make money. And therefore, that's how we end up in prison a lot. Like in 1974, and I know this, I just wrote this down, Section 8 was passed. Remember your brother said in the 70s, the prison population grew? Why is because in our community, they kept giving us vouchers for these apartments in the Bronx. And as long as nobody in the household made over a certain amount of money, you can live there. So therefore, our father didn't work because if he worked, guess what happened? Our rent goes up. So he found different ways to find money. And this is how the prison populations kept growing. You understand me? So I felt victim to it. You understand me? Because I'm living in Section 8. I can't really get a job that's paying me a lot of money. Because if I do, then my rent is going to go up. We're going to lose the food stamps. You understand me? So I found every day a different way to make a shortcut. And I end up going to prison. It's my fault. But at the end of the day, we're being set up for it. I'm taking full responsibility for my actions. But at the end of the day, we are being set up. Our children is being set up too. Like in prison too. I mean, in school. You understand me? You go to the metal detectors. But the next thing you know, when you're racking right down, you already know what to do. <laughs> crazy. That's crazy. I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that perspective, my G. So, you know what I'm saying? I, I definitely wanted to hear that. You know what I mean? Just the, and, and that visual image, you know what I mean? I, I do workshops in high schools. And we gotta go through it all the time. And so just seeing, I would even in my high school when I went there, it goes all the way back. You know what I mean? Uh, living that experience as well. So I definitely appreciate that perspective. Uh, we got Chairman Fred on. Chairman Fred, right on, brother. Right, you gotta unmute yourself, Chairman. Right on. I'm I'm, I'm self critical for coming in late, man. But good to see you, man. Is that light too? That, that light too bright in the back? No, it's man. That's that's you. You just shining, man. You naturally shining, brother. We already know. <laughs> So you're right, man. Man, good to be on deck, man. You know, um, I'm uh, I'm I'm honored and humbled to be on be on with you. I'm just getting getting in, so you know, bring up the speed. Where we at? Well, yeah. So so we we just we we you you arrived right on time, right on time, right. perfect. We're just doing the introductions. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we have brother uh, Danny Murillo from the West Coast. I know you got a lot of fam in the Bay Area, so now you got another comrade in the Bay Area no. to connect with. You know what I sure. mean? That was that was breaking it down. We got the brother Jose B X. That, that he entrepreneur from the hood. He got the clothing company, the Bronx logo, just came home, you know what I'm saying, a little bit more than a year ago. And, you know, we have the comrade uh, Lisa, Jesse Peterson, an amazing artist, uh, author, poet, that's been doing amazing work uh, behind bars with young folks, you know what I'm saying, and spreading the, the revolutionary culture. Um, right. And so, you know, since we got you here, definitely want to, uh, you know, bring you up to speed what it was, but to also welcome you, you know, we have, before you were here, I was talking about how, you know, we've been, we go, we go way back with Chairman Fred, you know what I mean? We, uh, yes. you know, we, we, at this point, we consider you fam. All the work that we've been through, yes. the building and, and, you know, but even before the social forums in Atlanta, the social forums yes. in Detroit, to the yes. murals, you know, yes. and, and it's crazy because now, you know, this year, uh, you know, the, 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 we've seen an explosion and, and, and I see it as a wonderful thing from afar, you know yeah. what I mean? Because of this, you know, this, this Hollywood movie that were clear, you know what I'm saying? Uh, was, was a, uh, you know, I, I, your support in it, I feel like was a, a, such an important political tactic. And I just, I feel like showing that that reality that, you know, okay, we gonna let this perspective be told from Hollywood, but the story's gonna come out, you know what yeah. I'm saying? And, and seeing young folks, you know what I mean? Be inspired by it. Um, for me, is an amazing thing. And seeing you, you know, everywhere, you everywhere, man, you know what I'm saying? It's been a beautiful <laughs> thing from, from afar to see yeah. that that legacy uh, be brought back, you know, how, how it should be because of the importance of the legacy of your father, Chairman Fred. But not only that, the work that you've maintained in your life, you know what I mean, is also a lifeline, a continuation of that. So um, I want you to just basically just share a little bit, folks that are tuned in, you know what I mean? We're on Facebook right now. Um, 
let folks know a bit, no, about, okay. a bit about Chairman Fred. Yeah, we, we live, we live right now on Facebook. No, I feel weird. Been on, I, well, I won't say that. Yeah, I, I mean, I ain't been on Facebook in a while, so go, hey, I'm, I'm, let me let me go in. Let me see the time. There you yeah. go. Let let, let talk, talk to us, Chairman. How you been, man? I've been good, man. Uh, <clears throat> First and foremost, I'm uh, again I'm honored and humbled to be here. Um, Rod, revolutionary love and respect and appreciation, dog, uh, Reverend Diaz. You, you know what I'm saying? And just our long, our long standing relationship, um, literally on the ground. You know, um, I just, just when you just, when you were just speaking, I just flashed back. To, you know, what I'm saying um, campaigns. You know, what I'm saying whether you know uh, addressing you know campaigns with me, Abu Jamal, and other political prisoners to that of uh, utilizing. Um, to uh, address the situations uh, such as the detention you know, so, um, between the black and brown community when the state, in which the state, you know, um, is, is everything else in our community that the state set up and doing it and doing it when it's hot. In fact, we got a saying, the Black Panther Party Cubs, we, we serve hot food and we serve hot politics. Um, soon as things, soon as, soon as situations are, you know, are, uh, are put out there, you know what I'm saying? Even if you're not, we don't be in physical contact, we hitting each other. Moving on it, right there on it, um, from the the, the the mural, which which uh, the, the wall on Madison, California, west side of Chicago, which was done post the campaign um, to have the street in which Chairman Frey and Defense Governor Mark Clark were assassinated on, named in their honor, in the state, the fraternal police. I mean, they brought out all their big guns, the heavyweights, and they fought us tooth and nail. You know, and you mentioned the social form in Detroit. You know, so we right there, seize the time. You know, it's the comrades, and we, we say, okay, what's our next move? You know what I'm saying? Right on it. You know what I'm saying? We had, I think, the 2010, got that initial um, initial mural up, and this follow up has been phenomenal. It's, it's, it's um, you know, the call we received from y'all, you know, so let's, let's do this again, 2020 on anniversary to do that. And just uh, again, connecting the work, you know what I'm saying, the community, outside community, to what's happening inside the uh, camps, you know, the, the, the concentration camps, in fact. We relate to a minister UAP News said that prison is a microcosm of the outside community. And then you know, just um your your you all's role in particular, I'm just flashing back to you know Sam, years back, you know, the uh the, the youngsters with uh y'all had up in the loft, you know what I'm saying, you, you, you know, not engaging in art for art's sake, you know, some time and just some concrete, you know, saying programs, making that also addressing not just the connection from the inside the prison, excuse me, the concentration camps to the outside community. But in the spirit of internationalism, you know what I'm saying? People, you know, we, we in, in the, one of the tactics that the colonizer lay, you know, employs on the colonized community is to engage in subjectivity. In other words, well, if, it, if it's not on my cell block, I'm not tripping. If it's not on my block, I'm not tripping. If it's, you know, not in my respective community, you know what I'm saying, I'm not tripping. But, you know, with the deal is we have, not just in, not just in theory, but in practice, we have, you know, so we have taken on campaigns that is connected, you know, saying um, uh, Chile to Chicago. We have campaigns to, you know, uh, the close the close of 50 schools, public schools in Chicago, you know, saying the connecting it to what's happening in New York, and you know, what I'm saying I'm, um, in case after case. So I just want to I just want to preface with that. Um, as you said, also we in a time right now when certain discussions are uh, people people's political pores. I'm saying we, we say, we say the pl people's pl political pores are, are open. And that the record reflect. This is these are conversations that we've been having, even though you know uh, um, sometimes you know the climate wasn't conducive. For some people, a lot of people, to relate to it. And the reality is, people get involved in struggle, become quote unquote conscious, one of three ways: inspiration, aspiration, or desperation. And um, I respect you. I respect the um, Reverend Diaz and the consistency. And this is this is a time right now. You know, so again, when. Um, People recognize, you know, the, the political um, dynamics and everything. If you want to talk about music, you want to talk about, you know, the um, the, the laws, you know, the, uh, the coronavirus. In fact, we say that this climate with coronavirus is capitalism on steroids. It's more magnified. It's, in, it's intensified. What's been going down on a day-to-day -day basis in our communities? We re we relate to what uh, Commandante Ernesto Che Guevara said in regards to propaganda. The role of the propagandist can be as important as that of the guerrilla. You know, so so even the movie. Um, Judas and Black Messiah, that was a, a, a hell of a battle. In fact, it's ironic you mentioned, I just was struggling with some cats recently who they were, you know, going through historical tactic of trying to turn these hearings now. And this came, these COINTEL Pro hearings. And it's, you know, and I told people, you can never let your guards down because they're already trying to 
go back and grab people, you know, uh, the, the speak in our interest, you know, you know what I'm saying? And this is um, something that we had to we do damage control for everything on, on the movie set, because I mean, everything from some of the, the initial proposed titles, not only proposed, they had the titles set for the movie. We had to go do, we had to go clean house. We had to go deal with those contradictions and um, scripts and so much misinformation that we had to do because you know, the narrative is, you know what I'm saying, in so many cases, whether it be on the movie set, the music industry, our movements, it does not come from, you know what I'm saying, um, those who on the ground who are engaged in it. So the, the, the discussion of self-determination has to be intertwined, has to be not, not only intertwined, but has to be on the forefront, you know, so when we engage in, in, in any conversation about, you know, is the, the mass kidnapping our people, so on and so forth, because it shouldn't be a foregone conclusion that everyone has an issue <clears throat> with, um, the, um, the the mass incarceration, the mass kidnapping uh, of colonized people. It should not be a foregone conclusion. Everyone has an issue. Um, what's happening in the streets of Chicago, which is infamously referred to as Chirac. You know, because the reality is there there's there's big business uh, of of this. They're they have you know, uh, plans set. You know, saying based on us going to the penitentiaries and to the graveyards. So in so many cases, as Chairman Frey would say. They get you know they get Frank James stop with uh, uh, we look for Frank James stop what Jesse James is doing, so this is a continuous battle most of us with the narrative for us to be again to speak in our own terms even in, in, even in the case of mistakes uh, 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 contradictions you know let, we let, let, us, let us not romanticize revolution you know you know that that you know we we had we had struggles before principal struggles you know, you know what I'm saying and and. and you know, and we had rules of the rules of engagement. How you know, what I'm saying how we deal with these contradictions, and you know, not you know, not just going to smear campaign, whatever, coming to a sit down, you know, laying out and say, you know, how, you know, laying out, okay, what points of unity? How can we you know? So we go deal is we 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 fighting for the greater good, and that's 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 something that we have to struggle and be able to utilize these these tools in social media and so on and so forth. However, never negating the meat. Of the matter, never negating the the, the, the basis. That's the people, you know. What I'm saying because again, you know, it's, it's, uh, without the people, revolution is impossible. And recognize these other different dynamics. This, uh, these tools can be, you know, um, uh, uh, um, useful in aiding with the struggle. You know, what I'm saying, but be, be real careful. It's fact, we say when Minister U.P. News said that power, power is the ability. Power, power is the ability to define phenomena and make it act in desired manner. And you know what I'm saying? And so we have to define a phenomenon as opposed to phenomenon defining us. So that, that, that that's imperative. That's what I want to say that. My brother, I'm doing, I'm all, I'm doing a Zoom interview right now. Pre right appreciate now. you, Chairman. Appreciate you uh, for, for breaking it down and giving us that update, you know what I mean? And, and those important words. I I, I, I was open up that inspiration, aspiration, and desperation line that you Hello. dropped. You're always being us with the gem. So that's right. definitely a, 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 a good way of looking at it. And I appreciate the work like that you were sharing you know what I'm saying, that, that we've done. And, and it's only going to be more. So you know, yeah. definitely salute you, brother, oh, for yeah. being here with us today. Um, I want to uh, pass the conversation over and, and welcome uh, Lisa, you know what I'm saying, to the conversation, um, you know, uh, and, and, and tell us a bit about the work that you do um, and, and, and about yourself for folks that, that, that haven't been in tune. Yes, yeah, thank you so much for, um, for having me. Um, to join this conversation, it's, it's really um, an honor to be um, amongst you know these these brilliant, powerful uh, warrior minds. Um, I I'm a poet, writer, um, actor. I call myself an artivist because my my art and activism intersect. And um, I didn't always start out that way. Um, you know, I was first introduced to the prison industrial complex system back in 1998, and um, I was supposed to go and teach a, a poetry workshop to incarcerated adolescent boys at Rikers Island, age 16, 17, 18 years old. And um, it was my first time in jail. Um, I didn't even know the difference between prison and jail. And, and this is 1998. So the term mass incarceration was not even in the zeitgeist. People were not even using that language. And um, it was my first week there. It was a correctional officer um, who said to me, he said, you don't know where you are, do you? And I said, yeah, I'm at Rikers Island, you know? And um, he said, no, he said, you're on a modern day plantation. And he pointed to the boys that were walking to class in their uniforms. He says, that's the new, they're the new crops, that's the new cotton. 
And I had never heard this language before, this metaphor of prison um, being, you know, compared to slavery. And he goes, I'll tell you what you do when you go home, you put prison industrial complex into the computer, see what you find. And when I see you tomorrow, we're gonna have a conversation about it. And so I did. So he literally, he, he boot kicked me down the rabbit hole. Again, this is in 1998. And so when I, when I started doing the research and I saw what was, you know, uh, was being revealed, you know, I, I was, I was mortified. I was shocked. It was like, it was like a fire was lit. And, you know, I became like an evangelist, you know? So when I came back to the classroom, um, I knew that, you know, it, it was more than about poetry. I, I knew I had to share this information with my students. So as I was learning, I was teaching them about the bigger system that they were um, ensnared in, um, you know, this, this, this prison industrial complex. And so, you know, that's, that was, like I said, back in 1998, and, you know, I've been on this path ever since, you know, and, and the three-week workshop turned into three years, and it turned, and it just became something that um, has been a part of my life. And, you know, when, you know, at the same time, I had, uh, you know, my boyfriend at the time was uh, serving um, time um, in, in a federal penitentiary. So in addition to working with adolescent boys every day, right, and, you know, learning about the prison industrial complex, going home, studying, I, just, I was just gobbling up information. And, and I couldn't believe that there wasn't like nobody was really ringing the alarm or the bell, you know, about this about this situation in, in terms of, I mean, in, in, you know, in the conscious community, yes, but as far as like art, like why, you know, nobody's talking about this. And so um, when I went to go um, visit my boyfriend and I had to go to Columbus Circle in New York City, I had never been to prison, right? So I had been to jail teaching the boys, but now I'm on the bus and I'm going, now I'm, I'm a visitor. So I'm, I'm not coming in the same way. And when I went to Columbus Circle at midnight, 12 o'clock midnight, there was a fleet of Greyhound buses. And there was hundreds of people, women, children with bags, and they were all getting on the different buses that was taking them to the different um, correctional facilities upstate. And I knew in that moment that I was witnessing one of the greatest love stories that hadn't been told. There was nothing but love getting on that bus because it was women, um, fathers, children, you know, traveling four, five, six hours, you know, to, to, to get to a correctional facility, to wait in line, to be searched, um, and, and to have a couple hours on the visiting room floor with a loved one to get back on that same bus and travel four, five, six hours back home and then to, you know, re-enter the community. And so, that was, um, you know, what inspired, uh, you know, my play, The Peculiar Patriot, um, which is, is about, um, you know, someone going to visit um, her, her best friend. So it was told from the perspective of a visitor and how, you know, the prison industrial complex doesn't only impact, you know, those who are behind the wall, who are behind enemy lines, but those who are, are putting money on the books, those who are getting on those buses, those who are accepting those phone calls and, and, and you know, pressing the number five and having your phone call for 20 minutes and then, you know, being interrupted. And so, you know, the whole idea of a peculiar patriot, you know, you, you know, back in, back in the antebellum South, they referred to Southern lawmakers, they referred to slavery as a peculiar institution because, slavery was too dirty of a word. They didn't want to put it in their mouth. They didn't want to say it. So they tried to sanitize it by calling it a peculiar institution. And we're still dealing with that peculiar institution. We're still dealing with, you know, uh, you know, slavery today. And every person that was on that bus to me is a peculiar patriot. Anybody who is supporting, you know, a peculiar soldier and a peculiar institution um, is a peculiar patriot. And so that, that's the, 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 the concept of, of the play, um, you know, that, that I wrote from my own personal experience from doing the research and, and feeling like, you know, you know I, I had a responsibility um, and, and, a, and a, just a, a passion to use my art and use my platform as an artist to bring forth this information to communities and people to really let them you know, understand the, the full picture of, you know, what this um, draconian system is and how it impacts, um, you know, everyone involved. 
So, um, so, so that's 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 pretty much been, been my journey. Um, and you know, I'm 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 still, you know, doing the work today. That's what's up, Lisa. I appreciate that that uh, you sharing that that about your work and about your experiences, um, which which kind of leads like the conversation. I feel like it's flowing, so I appreciate that you bringing that up. It made me think a bit about about kind of like the people that profit off these prisons, that the, the business behind some of this. Uh, Jose, I want to shoot, you know, you and the BX. Tell me a bit about, you know, we had shared a bit about, about like when you was in there, like, you know, the finances, like, like the commissary. I remember, so I, I'll share, um, you know, I, I, nothing too crazy, but when I was, when I was about 19, uh, I caught a little case. And I remember when I was, you know, the sentenced, um, I ended up doing like 90 days. And I remember, you know, obviously not much, but I remember the, one of the things that impacted me was that on commissary, the the flip flops, the toothbrush, the soaps were all from Bob Barker, right? Yeah. Bob Barker, the dude that used to host uh, The Price Is Right, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And I remember bugging out like, yo, this is crazy. Like, the dudes invested <laughs> in like, you know, like even the toothbrushes were literally, you know, Bob Barker brand. Tell me a bit about your experience, Jose, with some of that, and just let you know me, how commissary worked and stuff like that. Okay, well, commissary. You know, it's, it, it, it comes in a list, you know, and if you don't got no money, you're not getting anything. You know, that's why your family has to send you money or you get a job in jail. When you get a job in jail, like me, for me, I worked for the Department of Motor Vehicles in prison. The New York State Department of Motor Vehicles in prison, I was a call agent. So if you called and you're inquiring about, let's say, your driver's license or something, I answer the phone and be like, hey, thank you for calling DMV. My name is Jose. How can I assist you today? That's a yeah. fact. And getting good bread. I was actually making $63 every two. You understand me? So I ain't need nothing in jail. I was like, I was like El Chapo, right? For real. So that's, me. that's crazy. But, I, I didn't know that story about the DMV. That's wild. Yeah. So $63 every two weeks is when you break a crime, you go you fall under the 13th Amendment, and therefore you can work under slave wages. So when you put people in these prison populations, you got Colecraft, which is another company that uses inmates, you know, to produce tables and chairs, and they sell it to, to businesses across America for at a crazy flip, because you get in it on the low, and you got inmates working on slave wages. So this Colecraft, Colecraft, you said? It's yeah, called Colecraft. C O R A F T. It's a private company. You can't even buy stocks in it. That's that fucked up part about it. Let's talk about stock. When you're an inmate, when you become a, in, when you get indicted, you get bonded. A private company will bond you. Meaning, let's say you got your crime wor is worth a million dollars, right? A company comes and bonds you. And you know that term, pay your debt back to society, comes from? No, no. Meaning, you got to pay back that million dollars to the person who bonded you. And it, say, how many years going to take you to pay that company back? It's going to take them five to seven years. So that's how much time you get. You don't get time for the crime. Mm. You get time for the money they bonded because that's how much you got to pay it back. How long is it going to make them to get your money back? That's what pay your debt back to society means. They just masquerade it with the crime. That's crazy. That's, that's crazy. How, Anyway, okay. yeah. appreciate that insight, G. That's what's up. Yeah. I, 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 I I'm never going back. back to, to, I volley to the West Coast. Um, Danny, you know, one of the things that, that impacted me about, about your story was the amount of time that you spent uh, in solitary confinement in, in the shoe, right? Um, and you were you were at Pelican Bay? Yeah, yeah. And and how, how long did you spend in, in solitary? The last seven years, you said? Yeah, well, yeah, 2003, summer 2003, and I was released January 2010. Wow, okay. So, you know, when I, when I first heard that, I remember I had read before about the Angola Three. The Angola Three were political prisoners in Louisiana who did like 40 years or something like that in, in, in solitary. And so I had never, besides that case, I had never really met, you know, somebody that was like, yo, this is what I lived. Tell us a bit about... Um, that experience, but also the since you've been out, the the uh, you know you've been very vocal in speaking out against uh you know the solitary confinement as as a form of torture even 
Uh, right, tell us right. a bit about that experience and then about the work that you've been doing uh, around that to shut that down. For, for sure, for sure. I think, um, you know, uh, as a kid, right, I remember I was 15 years old telling someone that, you know, they told me you're going to either end up dead or in prison. And my response was, you know, um, if I end up in prison, I'm going to end up in Pelican Bay Shoe. Um, for us in my community, it was something that was looked at a, a, as a place that was revered, right? People that came out of Pelican Bay Shoe, out of Corcoran Shoe, out of solitary confinement prisons, you know, uh, or level, or what we call maximum security prisons, level four, are people that we look up to, right? Because they're coming up from, they're coming from the trenches, right? And, um, and so, you know, and I live in a community where there's, you know, we've been going to prison in my community at least since the 1960s, um, right? And, and so getting to prison, going to solitary confinement, halfway through my prison sentence, you know, um, once I get there, like I knew that it, it, I was set up, right? You know, I was set up, in, in particular how I was sent to prison, it was a, a, an awakening moment, right? Like they were using cultural symbols, right? Um, they were using um, um, Aztec drawings, Mayan drawings, right? Drawings that I collected because they were part of my cultura, right? A as uh, prison gang like, symbols. Right, I had I had a I had a, a a a picture of the Mexican flag, that that's a prison gang symbol, right? And 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 so they were using these things to 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 label me a prison gang associate, right? And so for me, that that with that said is that you know your cultura is a crime, right? For black people, it was you know having literature of Asada, having literature of George Jackson, that would label you a prison gang associate or a gang member, right? And so what they're doing, they're they're trying to take away the things that are going to empower you. Right. And so what happens is like in, in, in general population, when you tell somebody, hey, let's read a book about the cultura, let's read a book about the Aztecs, like now nah, fuck that shit. I'm not gonna read that and end up in solitary confinement because I want to learn about my people. Like, nah, I'm good, though. You know what I mean? And so we stay in this, in this, in this, in this um, you know, um, very individualistic, you know, inmate mindset, right? Um, and so for me, that experience was, you know, one of many that were empowering, right? That were transformative, right? Um, and made me realize that, th that there was, um, that this is a setup, right? Um, and, and so, you know, using that um, experience in the shoe, you know, coming home, you know, um, that transition, right? Uh, I was already prepared to, to, to make a difference with my life. I just didn't know what it was. And, you know, as, as I said, man, we, I snuck into UC Berkeley, right? And, and it was there that, that um, while at UC Berkeley, again, I met the, my first day of school, I met someone that was in Pelican Bay Shoe, right? Who was also part of building underground scholars, but also with this individual, um, we, we we became part of the Prison Hunger Strike Solidarity Coalition, right? Which was supporting the California Prison Hunger Strike, um, which was supporting, I'm sorry, the Short Corridor Collective. The Short Corridor Collective was a group of men in solitary confinement, right, at Pelican Bay State Prison, who came together to um, call an end to hostilities in California state prisons, California jails, California facilities where we would want, they wanted, the call was to put our, anything, you know, um, these racial and geographic uh, conflicts that exist, that have existed for over 40, 50 years, you know, to put an end to that, right? That was a call to end hostility, was to, to bring a, an end to the racial and geographic conflict that is in the California prison, and to unite, um, to, to engage in, in, in a hunger strike. It was three hunger strikes, three total hunger strikes that, that, came, that came about that, that movement, right? From the short quarter collective, right? Men sitting in solitary confinement that had been in solitary confinement 20, 30, 40 years, right? That came together and saying like, you know what, we need to do something, right? Because all we've seen is just a cycle of people just coming back and coming back, right? And so that, that movement, right? Um, with folks on the outside, me included, you know, I, I lent my voice, talked about my experience, you know, and, and talked about the torture of what it is to be in solitary confinement, right? That place is designed to break you physically, mentally, and spiritually, right? And, and I've seen people break, right? And, and what it does to people, right? And so for me, you know, um, you know, the work that I do is not just providing access to higher education for incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people, but also seeing an end to, to, um, to just want to see an end to prisons, right, in general, right? But, but also definitely bringing an end to solitary confinement in, in, in as many forms, right? You know, I think, you know, um, right now, you can be held in solitary confinement for up to five years in, in California prisons, but I think even that in itself is still too long, right? The United Nations says anything after 14 days is cruel and a new punishment, right? And we have people that have been sitting in solitary confinement for lifetimes, right? And, and, and possibly, and still are sitting in solitary confinement, right? And so for me, it, it's, it's also a, 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 you know, it's a form of genocide, right? It's how you break up community, right? Not just, um, 
you know, the distance between families, right? You know, as, as Lisa mentioned, right? Uh, and, and then also, um, you, 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 um, it creates these cycles, right? You know, I came home and my little brother wanted to follow in my footsteps. My nephew wanted to follow in my footsteps. They've been to prison. They've been to jail, right? And, and, and you know, um, being at UC Berkeley gave me an opportunity to give them a different space, right? And being at UC Berkeley, you know, with among other formerly incarcerated people, allowed them to find their own lane, right? Now, my little brother's at UC Santa Barbara. My nephew's about to transfer to Cal Poly Pomona, to the Cal University of Cal Poly Pomona. So, you know, it goes back to um, education. It is transformative, right? But it needs to have context, right? And it needs to be political, right? Without a political education, right? We're going to get stuck in these individual cycles of just trying to make it on our own, right? And realizing that there's power in unity and in collective unity. And I appreciate that that perspective on, on collective, you know, having an idea of collective justice. Like, yeah, you gotta go to college, but this education you're gonna get is gonna be political education. So that's what's up. I appreciate you sharing uh, from that personal experience, man. And that's what's up. And salute to you, brother, for that work. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that you here with us, cause seven years is a long time. You know what I'm saying? It's out of take confinement, bro. So real talk, respect, respect. Um, swinging it back to Chicago, Chairman. Um, it's a year after George Floyd, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, and, I, and I share this, you know, because the conversation is about mass incarceration, but we're clear that, you know, the, the, you end up in jail, but what goes, what goes on outside, you know what I mean? Uh, for folks that are being hunted, I, I, I like the fact that you use straight up terms like concentration camps and people being kidnapped. You know what I'm saying? I, I honor that because I feel like a lot of times folks we, we, we even use the language and the terms of the oppressor, but we got to call it for what it is. Our people are being kidnapped. Um, where do you see, you know, I, I appreciate that, that perspective as well uh, about this pandemic being capitalism on steroids. It's 2021, you know what I'm saying? Where do you see uh, the movements going? A year after George Floyd, right? We got this, you know, guilty verdict or whatever for the, you know, they sacrificed the cop. You know what I'm saying, but tell us, tell us what what, what direction you see this going. I'm I'm interested in hearing hearing your perspective on. It. Right on. It's you know, <clears throat> it's tug tug and pull, highs and lows and struggle, and you know, um, we um, I said earlier, just uh, 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 Minister UP News said the prisons are a, a microcosm of the outside community, and. I just got, you know, we have our weekly radio show, Free of All Radio, we have every Wednesday. It, was, I, 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 uh, it should be posted on YouTube now. Yeah, the, uh, this was unplanned if it would happen, you know. I mean, it's this type of shows we have. We have some a live direct calls in from us. Smith Prison in Georgia. Smith Prison in Georgia. And these 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 guys was literally telling us, this one cat, uh, they, they they gave me heads up about a week ago. Said we about to file this this this, this, uh, this um, lawsuit, so on and so forth. And, we, and, I, and, and they, it's in the stress and importance of the outside support. And I, we have a pro, um, program called One Prison One Contact. But let me let me let me tell you about what's happening in Smith Prison before, before I talk about that. And it was given the details, horror details. It was happening right now. I'm not talking about you know some years back to within this last week's time. Guys was talking about in the prison on the gallery, this individual being inside the cell, they're on the gallery and they hear the, the guard, the, 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 the guy in the cell and uh, the, um, they, the guards put this individual in there, they know his mental health con uh, uh, issues. He's got one guy in the cell, the guy screaming through the door, he's tied, he, the other guy, the cellmate is tying him up, raping him, stabbing him to death. And you know, so this is it's Smith Prison this week, this week in Smith Prison. Uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, another guy uh, hung this uh, literally hung in the cell for uh, I think uh, over over twenty hours. You know what I'm saying? Um, just hanging in the cell, dead. And while this is going on, we get some calls. We get, we get another call from jail. Excuse me, from the concentration camp. Some of the women in Illinois, um, Illinois, and, and they're talking about the different. You know what I'm saying? The the, the, the uh, brutal uh, atrocities happening. You know what I'm saying? As we speak, you know, talking about. Um, uh, the, the the whole the, the the forcing of the vaccinations on them, the, the, you know what I'm saying? Um, this so so many you know horror, horror stories. Uh, again, is um, this, I, I recommend people check it out. But this whole 
I would say even between the George Floyd case, we can't afford just even having a reactionary assessment of it. We the, the stage of the game we in one is terrible, but it's fine because again, that's that, that's that's a, that's a struggle coming from the ground up. But historically, it's always an attempt to, as Malcolm X talked about the initial mar the march on Washington, when the state said we can't stop it, co opt it, ward it down, change it, make it something to be. We had a climb when you see, you know, post, um, uh, 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 you see cases such as um, Diamond, Diamond Lavish Reynolds, um, uh, Philando Castillo, when he's murdered uh, by the police and her right there saying, in plain lamest terms, you, you, you killed him. Her coming out of that jail. With the road, road, road up that Newport box of cigarettes and saying you killed him. Not saying I'm gonna wait till my lawyer come before I speak. You know, um, uh, let me explain Mike Brown's mother coming out and playing lamest turn. They, you, you're wrong. This is important. You know, so this, this type of cases as opposed so many like the state, the ruling class. They have, they use cold words when they kill us. They say terms like, you know, we are the African American leaders. We are the spokesperson. That's a cold word for the state sanctioned spokesperson to come down and speak for us. You know, you don't have to have no, no, no degree. You know what I'm saying? To say, man, my son or my daughter got shot 15 times. This is this wrong, this bogus. You know what I'm saying? And, and that's that dynamic of self determination is imperative that we, that we, that we, we hold a line, that we hold a line on that. Field Marshal George Jackson, from the Black Panther Party, told me, you know, he said, capitalism not only affects the economy, but it affects the psychic of the people. That whole, that should be a case, a case study that there's that, just a, the footage that we've seen, you know what I'm saying, from different perspectives in regards to the, the George Floyd. Look at the, look at the, 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 the I mean, it's just, it's not, a lot of people, they, they talk about our, our situation, our conditions in a, a reactionary way, just minimizing just that of the, the military military aspect or the physical aspects. Here's, you have, you, you have, you have witnesses. One brother who, I mean, I think he's some sort of uh, MMA, M, was MMA fighter. You know what I'm saying? What's, what, is, what is instilled in us? You know what I'm saying? The, the climate. You know what I'm saying? For, for, for these pigs that come through and, and, just, and move as they do. But what is, it should be stopped right there soon. You look at, look at the, the, the brother that was in the passenger seat with George Floyd. Just, I mean, out of, right there through the door. When you get the terms you use, you know what I'm saying? Bosses. You, you, you just make it black and white. You, you, it's like, a, it's like a, uh, uh, during the era of chattel slavery. It's supposed to talk about, you know, how they strategically use you know, the, the, the term peculiar institution. This system knows the importance of euphemisms. You know what I'm saying? So we say brutal terms for brutal realities. The whole dynamic, the what is what has got what is what George, George Floyd, because I have to get this was even during the climate of the coronavirus. You know what I'm saying? Uh, this, this happened, you know what I'm saying? Because like we've been going through this, it's like picking like it's normal. You just say, damn, this was, that, that, that was coronavirus. But then, what is, is going on is behind those walls and those concentration camps? You could see him like, man, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to go there. You know what I'm saying? These are type of questions, you know, like I, you had to say, what is the breaking process? What, and it's, um, I equated to when the photographs were released in Abu Ghraib, Baghdad, by the, by the, by the guards, man, by the guards. This, this is the arrogance. The, the guards, and Matt, one, the guards have released those videos, videos of prisoners in Abu Ghraib, Baghdad with dogs, you know, being put, uh, sitting on the private parts of your prisoners. Um, stacking, stacking people up on top of each other, naked. And some, you know, so one guard worked at SCI Green when, when Mia Abu Jamal was there. So these, 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 these homegrown terrorists, you know, what I'm saying? These guys, so you know, they took this. It was acknowledged across seas. They, they, they're writing in, in the U.S. And the type they asked some of the, 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 the prisoners later on, said, so, you know, why didn't you talk about this? Some said we tried, you know, we tried to file grievances. We tried to, you know, so go through the process. Nobody would believe us. Other prisoners said. We were so embarrassed. What happened to us? You know, say there are so many atrocities. You know, saying that you know, what I'm saying this 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 conversation it is it, it ties into any conversation you want to have. Whether we're talking about reparations, because the reality, you know, African people, you know, saying Puerto Rican people, you know, saying, people in Chile, all colonized communities have been ripped up for a lot of resources to this day. The oil, copper, resource, but the most valuable resource that we ripped up for is bodies, our our people. You know, you know, what I'm saying. And I'm just, not just limited to that of doing the Atlantic slave trade. I'm talking present day. And it's, and it's so strategic. I mean, that you know, time we get caught up like, oh, man, such such just get out. They did 30 years and we 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 happy about it. But this system is so strategic. The snatching up generations during the reproductive periods. This is, if they stop, if they just stop kidnapping us today, the ongoing impact, you know what I'm saying? And, it, and we have to acknowledge, it's the certain that we can't even fathom. This is, you know what I'm saying? And Pontiac. 
Pontiac and Lawrence was the infamous Pontiac 17 uprising happened in 1977. In fact, um, Larry Hoover, chairman of GD, he's he was one on, on that case. In fact, Daly, Daly, Mayor Daly Jr. was the state's attorney on that case. You know what I'm saying? Pontiac, they have a, when I was in Pontiac in 1998, they had a, a policy where these prisons, prisons would be brought down on visits with black net masks over the face, rubber grill over the mouthpiece. Now you're behind this glass and your child is seeing this. And then they had a, 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 a convenient of wardens throughout the country. And they literally came up to, to redesign the sales to be shorter than the average man. We we could even fathom sitting at a meeting and saying, okay, now, now what's the, I mean, and it's not, well, maybe it was for security, maybe it was for better economics. No, they, they the, the whole, the, the, what type, who they would, what they would create. This, you know what I'm saying? This is, the, the this is prison, are not for rehabilitation, it's designed, you know what I'm saying, to break the men, will, and spirit of people. And you know what I'm saying? And again, it's, and it, what it does to our community, it's like, and we see at a George Floyd case, Granite Taylor case, so many other cases. We the, the, the Reed case uh, uh, in, in, in Louisiana. You know what I'm saying? You see the the arrogance what they do in the outside community with cameras on. With cameras, the, the arrogance. Imagine, you know what I'm saying? In fact, we can't imagine behind closed doors. You know what I'm saying? What's happening to you know what I'm saying? And in, in, in the and it, it's, it's toxic that you got if you come up out of there alive, what you know what I'm saying, to hold it in and not to be able to sum up politically what you know what I'm saying. I had to put a policy when I was in Menard. Menard, one of the most notorious plantations. Chairman Fred was there in 1969, I was there in 1999. My letters were like wheels. I was, I went up on a comrade in the business. I said, What part don't you understand? I'm not coming out of here alive. The the the, the dynamics that uh, I'm just flashing back now. So you know, your situation with Nard, man. This, the, 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 uh, I had to put a policy, in a term, um, uh, and, and policy was blood in my mouth. This was in uh, Field Marshal George Jackson wrote blood in my eye. This was in response to, they would do tactics like when you they would they would bring you up on business. They would listen to my phone calls and they would hear mother comrade, court other comrades when they come down, 10, 12 hour drive. Uh, place your isolation, you know what I'm saying? So you, 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 you want me to get a visitation. One brother in particular was going to visit his grandmother and it was, you know, she was, she was up in age and everybody knew this, this would probably be you know, the last time you get to see her. He goes up there for the visit and right before they go up to the visit, they tell this cat, he has oh, he has to cut his dreadlocks. He has to cut his, you know what I'm saying? That's the only way he can visit his grandmother. And it was, I mean, it was no, it was, and, and I remember this, uh, uh, in, in, in once in, without the political assessment of why, the, you know what I'm saying, what positions you take, it can break you, you know what I'm saying? So I, I, I said, never swallow your tongue, pick your moves and let your moves pick you. And it, you know what I'm saying? But that's that's the purpose of this dynamic, you know what I'm saying? To, to break the, the real spirit of men, women, and children. We had a case in, in, in Chicago, it was documented. Even this cat was 14 years old, a youngster. They had shot this youngster up with so much medication. They took his, it was documented, they had took his sperm count down from a thousand to a zero. This, um, this is the type, it's not, we have to look at this, I mean, the, the science to this, you know what I'm saying? We, we can't, we, we just want to do, have a, you know, like just say, oh, he's locking us up, this racist, so and so. The policy, you look at the, you know, the move, the, 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 the children that move, you know, it was exposed by Penn State, different universities, having the, the remains of the babies at the bombing of 1985, the complicity, the judges, the court rules, the businesses, all of the different dynamics, the different tentacles of imperialism, and you know what I'm saying? And it's political. And that's how we have to sum this up. Again, everything is political. I appreciate you, Chairman, making these international connections. Uh, I know Danny was hitting me up about that before earlier about, about having a conversation because it's real. I had no idea that, that, uh, that um, what do you call it, that one of those guards in Abu Ghraib was, was, had been one of Mumia's guards. That, that, yeah. That's a crazy, you know. I think, little, I, think, little... I think his name was Grainer. I think his name was Grainer, if I'm correct. I think his name was Grainer. And so I share that because, for example, you know, G started it off. It kind of comes full circle with the conversation. My brother G started it off uh, with some graphs showing, you know, basically mass incarceration. You can't talk about it without talking about colonialism, about the genocide, about slavery. You know what I mean? Like, this is the foundation of what we're dealing with. And so I, I think it's crazy, you know, like, you know, we're from Cheetah. My father was tortured by School of the America trained, you know what I'm saying, torture tactics. We export these torture tactics, you know what I mean? When we talk about Danny doing seven years uh, in, in solitary confinement, these are torture tactics that are part of imperialism that is not just used uh, 
and prison populations with you know prisoners from here. Um, so I appreciate those international connections. Right now, we have genocide going on in Palestine. We have people being murdered on the streets of Colombia. You know what I'm saying for resisting. When we talk about U.S. empire, who are the number one allies of you know Latin America? Colombia has. I think about 12 military bases. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 12 military yeah. bases that they have in Colombia. And so when you talk about mass incarceration, you know what I'm saying? You're talking about a drug trade that's been ran by the CIA yeah. from day one. Yeah. They choose yeah. who's going to be the next cartels. And so we're clear that what's going on in Colombia, we have to make those connections, you know what I'm saying, to, to a prison population because we're clear that, you know, uh, US imperialism has, has funded. You know what I'm saying? Uh, we 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 funded wars, you know, with the supposedly you know war on drugs. And so I uh, appreciate you you bringing them, them them international connections. I want to invite my brother G. Um, G, you want to do? Because I, I I know Elena always be asking us to do a little joint, so we always gotta bring the culture up. So we are gonna do a little joint real quick. Uh, G, you you there? Illinois, you here? Let me see. If my brother's still around. Yeah 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 yeah. What up? What up? Yeah. I'm here. Too. All right, so we gonna do a little piece. Right this on, is right a piece. On that we had rocked and dedicated to uh, the Angola Three and Sekou Odinga. And so welcome home, Sekou. Sekou been home for a couple of years. Welcome home, Eddie Conway. Welcome home, you know, the move, but we also say free them all because we're clear that, you know, we still have uh, too many of our freedom fighters behind bars. And we're clear that, you know, mass incarceration starts uh, with with the political you know incarceration of political freedom fighters and, and and who are now today our political prisoners that we should never ever forget you know what I'm saying people are in love with uh, you know the ideas of Black Panthers but we're forgetting about our Black Panthers who are behind bars so this is a a joint that we did produced by a brother out of London Agent of Change uh, and it's called Unbreakable G we haven't performed this ever I don't think we ever performed this but we're gonna perform it for y'all tonight yeah, yeah. Um, let me make sure my my speakers on. Uh, and then we do this. Let's see how we go. Y'all hear that? Yeah. Free Mumia Abu Jamal. Free Russell Maroon Schultz. Sundiata Kolai. Welcome home, Sekou. Welcome home, Eddie Conway. Let's go, y'all. Free them all. Y'all. Six by nine foot solitary cell. Talking to myself with nobody to tell. Conditions so hell, but we shall prevail. Freedom of jail, freedom of jail. The cause that are now is gonna always be noble. I see the youth working, so my spirit's so hopeful. They try to break the spirit for decades in humane. So much pain through their lives, but they so unbreakable. 40 years ago, Louisiana was the place and the country where your fate is still decided by your race. My rage can be defined by the state as a way to misbehave. So they put you in the big no sun race. Church on Sundays, hope you pray. Cause I can't wait to see the day that we can all get away. And when you hear my music play, I hope you relate. And feel the pain that these freedom fighters locked away. Can you see we enslaved? And we still get slain and they still walk away like we got nothing to say we need freedom today tomorrow and forever i'm just trying to live better so i'm writing this letter what the panther stood for is still relevant even though trayvon looks related to the president racism so alive and it's so so evident the killers watch me so you know it's at the president six by nine foot solitary cell talking to myself nobody to tell this is so hell but we still shall prevail Freedom of jail, freedom of jail. The cause that it now is going to always be noble. I see the youth working, so my spirit's so hopeful. They try to break the spirit for decades in your main. So much pain through their lives, but they so unbreakable. Long, 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 Voices calling out from behind the cell doors. Window to the world, four walls of concrete. I'ma be in this world, but I demand that they be free. Three million in jail, the numbers swell. Ever since COINTEL, how many prisons they built? Killed and infiltrated, put our leaders in cages. Flooded the drug trade and locked up a generation. But they ain't killed the spirit. We had children and grandchildren. Neighbors that listen, ideas that can't be in prison. The mission remains. Political prison, the struggle won't be in vain. Things gonna have to change, be game. I'ma build a platoon, a young Russell Maroons, so we can free say crew, Mutulu and Oscar too, I ain't forget about you, the suits gonna have to pay, what they doing is ain't made, the world gonna know your name. Six, five, nine, foot, solitary cell, talking to myself, nobody can tell, so hell, but we still shall prevail, freedom of jail, freedom of jail, the cause then and now is gonna always be noble. 
I see that you've worked so my spirit so hopeful. You try to break the spirit for decades and you made so much pain through their lives, but they so unbreakable. They unbreakable, y'all. They unbreakable. They unbreakable, y'all. They unbreakable, y'all. You know what I mean? <laughs> Illinois. Yeah, yeah, free of mall, free the land. DJ Illinois on the ones and two. <laughs> hey, it's crazy. I gotta Ooh. shout G out. So my brother G1, we call him like he like the hip hop MacGyver. Cause the minute the Zoom shit started. We was like, how are we going to perform? And G was like, yo, I got it. Look, I'm going to do this. I'm going to send you a piece of the beat. And then when I when I get to the, my last part, you just press play. And then you come in. So for no lie, no lie. I, I don't know nothing about technology. If it wasn't for G, I'll be at the crib doing no shows. <laughs> because of him, we've been able to exist online and get booked for Zoom shows. And you know what I mean? We got, he got Illa rigged up. Illa, we all in a different crib. But that was dope. The rock, so I definitely got to shut out G. Yes, and we happy that that song was that done was for Sekou, but he home. You know what I mean? And it yes, shows yes. you that the struggle for political prisoners, uh, you know, is is not something in vain that, you know, they have the victories. Oscar Lopez came home. Yes. You know what I mean? But we still say free Leonard Peltier. Yes. You know what I mean? Free David Gilbert. Uh, free Sundiata Cola. So many, yes. you know what I'm saying, that are still mm -hmm. behind bars. Free Mumia of yes. Jamal, who's been literally locked up as long as I've been alive, you know what I mean? And so I definitely want to share that piece. Um, part of the work that we do, we, we gotta keep it funky, gotta bring some hip hop into it. So yeah, that's how we always roll with DJ Illa, who's always down to jump on board. Um, Lisa, I wanted to pass, pass, pass the mic to you. I feel like we haven't heard uh, enough from you, but, but, but as an artist, what do, you, what do you see like the future as far as like the inter intersection of like arts and activism? You said you was an artivist, right? So tell me a bit about 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 how you see arts and culture being, you know, you being a part of activism in general, a part of social movements. Um, art, art is really critical. Art is a weapon, um, and you know the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so I've experienced firsthand um, the power of art and how art can um, transform. Um, can be used as um, as a revolutionary weapon. For example, I'll give you an example. I, um, and, and to kind of piggyback off of what um, Danny was talking about, um, education, how the two um, intersect. Back in um, January 2020, I had the opportunity of taking um, my play, The Peculiar Patriot, to um, Angola Penitentiary. And Angola Penitentiary is actually located on an actual plantation named after slaves who were from Angola. So it's actually on an actual plantation and that's where the Angola Three were. And um, it was uh, Alfred Fox who did 45 years in solitary confinement. So it's definitely um, a, a, the whole prison is just a, a torture chamber um, for our people. And so, you know, I had, I had performed my play in, in over 35 you know, prisons and penitentiaries across the country. And, um, you know, when, when I performed it at Angola, Right now, I'm on an actual plantation, um, and it, it was in a chapel of 700, uh, you know, um, brothers packed. And halfway through the show, <laughs> when I when I go backstage to you know get ready for my next scene, because my show was politically charged, you know, the brothers was feeling it. They was talking back to the stage. You know, it was electric. And I talk about you know the prison industrial complex, you know the prison, um, uh, uh, the privatization of prisons. I mean, I break down a lot of things, right? Um, so it definitely has, um, you know, I, I, I pack a punch. I really punch white supremacy and the system of capitalism and and um, the prison in the face with my art. And so the brothers were feeling it, like I mean, it was electric. So when I when I go backstage, it was a white correctional officer and um, who said uh, he was, uh, I was brought to Angola by a brother named um, um, uh, Norris Henderson, who did, um, I think, 25 years and he was exonerated. Um, so, you know, he, he's the reason why I was able to get the kind of access to, to, to Angola. And so all the brothers, they, they love him because he made it out and he helps them, you know, with their cases. So, you know, he's, he's definitely doing, you know, the Harriet Tubman work. And so when I get backstage, he said, he said, oh, we have to stop the show. It's been an emergency. 
And I knew in that moment that, you know, it was because of what I was talking about. Now, all my years, I had never, ever, ever at my show stopped. But I'm at Angola and I'm, you know, kicking the politics and, and they're loving it and they shut down the show. So when they came out and told and told the audience that you know brothers at the show was being you know stopped because of a, a fake emergency, I mean it was it almost caused a riot. The brothers were like, "Boo, oh, you know that's that bullshit. We know what's going on. Let us speak the truth. She's speaking the truth, you know." And so the whole chapel like erupted. And so when I came out, you know to, to you know to, to I guess you know bring closure, um, even though you know the show was cut short, you know, I just threw my fist in the air. All 700 men, they stood up, they threw their fist in the air. And it was, I mean, you could see the fear in the eyes of the slave catchers, you know, of the overseers. It, it, it was, I mean, if they could have they could have lynched me, they would have in that moment. And so I say all that to say that the reason why the show was stopped, and I'm very, very clear about it, and so were the brothers, because um several of the brothers contacted me afterwards to tell me what was going down what they were talking about was that the information was 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 activating the consciousness and so when they saw when when the slave catchers when they saw the consciousness being woken up and they saw that what what they were used to this kind of dormant you know docility and it was something was moving in that chapel they had to suppress it because of the information that was an art that was activating something in their spirit and this gets back to what Danny was saying about education, how, you know, in, 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 we have to center, you know, uh, 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 politics and, and education. And we can't expect sons and daughters of our former slave masters to teach our children. We cannot expect the former um, sons and daughters of our slave masters to teach our children. And so when we begin to um, re-educate ourselves about who we are, knowledge of self. And I use this in the classroom with my with my students and teach them about the Panthers and teach them about ancient Kemet, which um, is now called Egypt. Um, you know, you, you, there, there was a, a, they sat up taller. They listened, they leaned in, they wanted to get, they were, they were hungry for that information because it changes something in your consciousness. And when you change your consciousness, it affects your spirit and there's something and that cannot be controlled. So the, the art, my art is a weapon. My art was able to activate something in those brothers at Angola. So when, when, when we look at, you know, uh, uh, the work that you just did, you know, the work that you all, the Rebel D has, it's like the art is what will, 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 will um, amplify. Art can be amplified. Right. So it goes hand in hand. We have to have boots on the ground. We have to have comrades like, you know, Chairman Fred, you know, in the trenches. And we also have to have artists like yourself, like myself, that are using, you know, um, theater, poetry, um, hip hop to amplify the message so that, you know, when the kids are listening, you know, they're meditating to life. They're meditating and they're not in their head to a consciousness that's going to free them because right now they're meditating to death. And that's on purpose. That's by design. Hip hop has been infiltrated. Cointel Pro is now in hip hop, and it's very, very obvious why. Because it was because the art form was liberating the minds of young people. So the intersection, there's no, there, there, there's no question the importance of art and activism. Right on. Thank you, Lisa. That's what's up. Um, so that brings us a little quick time check. I told you it's crazy because these these things flow so quick. It's nine twenty eight. We're gonna wrap it up at nine thirty. I want to thank everybody, you know what I'm saying, for coming on. I feel every time I do this in Atlanta, I always tell them, man, they be going by so quick. I feel like I can't even get info, but that's the beauty of it that it leaves you wanting more. Um, so I want to thank everybody. I want to shout out, uh, y'all see I'm rocking my El Bronx hat, uh, my brother Jose, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm gonna stop saying it because you're right. You've been home already. We're gonna stop saying you just got home. You home, you with us, you're not that's going right. back. So I, I want it. everybody to make sure they support. Uh, he, you know, he laced me. I got, I got, he got the Bronx, you know what That's I mean? right. The Bronx logo. And he, you know, he, he, uh, hitting up every hood. And to me, you are inspiration, my brother. You know what I mean? I always, what I always tell mm. folks is, you know, Rebel Diaz, man, I always, I always stay, I keep it in the hood. That's why I build when I ain't trying to build with other folks. And so Jose, uh, you inspire me, my bro. I appreciate that hashtag not going back to jail. Uh, mm. it's way more powerful than you even realize it, my G. So I want yeah, to I appreciate you that. Appreciate you. Appreciate you guys, bro. Yeah, for joining us. Chairman Fred, you already know. I, I, I mm -hmm. got to go visit you, man. We got to link up. G, yes. Illa, we owe Chairman Fred. We're going to grab lunch. Next time I'm in Chicago, we're linking up. 
That's right. Lisa, it was amazing meeting yes. you. Yes. Even Thank though it's you. virtually, I appreciate your art. That story of Angola was crazy. Yes. I was there with you. And Danny, my brother, you already know, man, Underground Scholars, the Prisoner School Pipeline, man, is a, it's important work. Uh, and and I, I love the fact that you're not just talking about education for aspiration sakes, but education for political education. Um, so yeah, man, another another voice of the justice man. in the books. I want to send everybody uh, fist up. And uh, Cameron, if you can lead us on a call, what's the call? Free them all. What's free the call? Free them all. What's the call? Free them all. 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 Make hey, before, we, before we go, I want to thank you, you guys all. You guys brought all the all the issues together. It was so and so incredible how you brought, um, you know, the international issue, the um, the, the domestic issue, the education, um, the art, all of it together. I want to thank you all so much for taking part in this. Jose, Danny, Chairman mm -hmm. Fred, um, Lisa, thank you all so much, and of course all the guys in Rebel Diaz. We're always glad to work with you guys. Um, you know, whenever we do these programs. And I want to thank also um, Christine Licata for her help in this program and our fund of the New York Council for the Humanities as well. Before we go out, do you guys just want to end with maybe um, end on a up note with, some, with a leave with some art, maybe Lisa with a poem or something for, to go out, to close out the entire program? Does anyone want to take something out? Lisa or Rod yeah. Stars, any of you guys? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, do, I'll do a little excerpt. Um, this is a new uh, piece that's about to drop. Um, it's called Black Love Manifesto, and it's a celebration of who we are. This is an excerpt. Blue, black, brown, baby, buckshot, shorty rock, melanated prince, king, kissed by the sun, it's your soul of blessed skin, sculpted like a god, master crafted in my womb, first womb, ancient womb, safe and sacred womb, African fertile soil, black gold diamond oil, mineral rich, Mama, me, I, she, I, we, we stirred you up good, boy. You, potent, powerful, wonder, warrior of the world. You, who always had the planet, had not to your beat. Got the globe axis, leaning and tilted like your hat. Call it black swag, black cool, cat daddy funky blues, rock jazz juke joint, sugar shack sanctified, big boy cut type of stamp up. Type of monster 808 on the microphone check one two one two type of boom to the back the boom back soulful genius encoded in your DNA divine nappy archives coiled in your hair the creative rhythm love child and natural air to planet rock as poetry somersaults out your mouth your slang is slung around the world what you say how you say it what you wear how you wear it how you do it urban haiku it it's showtime, Olympic ghetto gymnastics, double back flipping to it, a one-handed handstand pop lock Harlem shaking for a Ron Jean pirouette and shell toe Adidas on crowded moving subway cars to Brooklyn, world-class concrete symphonies, underground ballet for a dollar donation. It was born with it, baby. <laughs> right on, right yeah. on. That right was on. perfect. Thank you so much, Lisa. That was incredible. Right thank, thank you, all, and, and you no. guys, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I'm sorry, Red, really, Red Stars, you want to take it out? No, I, I was just saying that was dope. That was dope. Peace yes, out there, everybody. Peace. Appreciate y'all, man. Thank you, guys. Peace. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks so much. Well, on. Thank, Thank you, guys. Guys. Well, on, yeah. Let's well, do it again. Let's do it again. Yes, indeed. I look forward to it. Respect. Right, peace, God. Well, on, man.